Those standing on the street could see Peter Vallon. There he was, in a window on the fourth floor. Next to him was a young woman. The image lasted only a second. Then it was obscured by heavy black smoke. When a breeze cleared the air a few moments later, Vallon and the woman were gone. People would tell stories about Peter Vallon that day. Newspapers printed those stories and placed them under dramatic headlines. Telling Vallon's story was perhaps the only way to soften the horror of one of the most tragic events in Pittsburgh's history. The day is October 25, 1915. It's a few minutes before one o'clock in the afternoon. Thirty women employed at the Union Paper Box Company are finishing their lunch break and heading back to work. All the women are young. A few are only 14 years old. They work in a four-story building. A feed store occupies the first floor. That's where Peter Vallon works as a laborer. Perhaps the young women saw him as they made their way to the stairway and up to the third and fourth floors to their workstations. As the women are resuming their tasks, a few notice wisps of smoke curling around the edges of the room. They're not alarmed. The smoke is probably from the Zenith Stove Company on the second floor. Still, the women are told to get their hats and coats and to line up so they can exit the building. The fire is no danger, the women are assured. They remain calm and orderly. The fire started in the back of the feed store, where bales of hay and other combustible materials are stored. Most likely, it was ignited by a carelessly tossed match or a lighted cigarette. The young women make their way to the stairs and start down. They get no further than the second floor. There, they are greeted by flames and billowing smoke. The women retreat quickly back to the upper floors. They discover that an elevator shaft has become a furnace, shooting smoke and flames upward. Some women run through tiers of boxes to the back of the building to a fire escape. Once there, they look down and see flames pouring from open windows below them and engulfing the steel steps. They retreat back into the building. A group of about six women make their way to a window three stories above an alley. One of the women throws her body against the glass. By now, the blaze has attracted several onlookers. Standing on Sandusky Street, they hear the shattering of glass at the side of the building. Suddenly, a young woman leaps from a window and falls several feet to the roof of an adjoining building. She is followed by others. Sisters Minnie and Tilly Bittner jump together. At least two women, witnesses say, pause briefly before jumping and are either bumped or pushed and fall straight to the alley below and are seriously injured. Other women are trapped. Pathways to windows are blocked. Smoke, heat, and panic add to the confusion. At least nine women seek refuge in a small cloak closet in the rear of the building. Gertrude Berry jumps from a third floor window and grabs onto a telephone wire. She remains there, swaying, until two men in a second story window seize her, then lower her into a wagon below. Thomas Blackburn stands in an alley and urges women to jump to him. He softens the falls of three or four. Then one woman lands on his face, breaking his nose and knocking him unconscious. About this time, witnesses report seeing Peter Vallon. He emerges from the building, carrying one young woman overcome by smoke. He passes the woman to bystanders, then runs back inside. Somehow, he makes his way to the upper floors. On the third floor, one newspaper reports, Vallon leads four women to windows and helps lower them to rescuers on the second floor. One man recalls tossing a rope to Vallon so women can climb down to safety. Later still, witnesses report, Vallon makes his way out of the building once again, carrying yet another woman. Much of Vallon's clothing had burned away. His face and hands were scorched. Many women are still trapped in the building. Onlookers can see them in the windows and hear the horrifying screams. Vallon tries to re-enter the inferno. Bystanders plead with him not to go. A few try to physically restrain him. And where are the firefighters? They're delayed in getting to the scene because the nearest fire alarm box fails. The alarm has to be sounded from another box a block away. In addition, the first hose utilized in the fight bursts in three places, rendering it useless. 
Still, firefighters raise ladders and attempt rescues. After 20 minutes, firefighters finally get water on the blaze. And less than an hour after the fire began, firefighters have it under control and enter the building. In the upper floors, they discover 13 bodies. Nine are clustered together in the small cloakroom where they sought refuge. Among the dead are Laura and Otilia Breening. Both are identified at the morgue by their younger sister, Ada, who, at age 13, had not yet begun a factory career. Dorothea Link's body is found. Her twin sister, Loretta Link, survives. The women and girls who perished earned between seven and eight dollars a week to work in a building that inspectors say they had condemned as a fire trap. The useless fire escape twisted and buckled in the heat. In the aftermath, Pittsburgh instituted a new building code and the state began rigid enforcement of its industrial safety laws. A year later, the city established its first fire school. And as for Peter Vallon, the body of this immigrant laborer who died alongside a dozen women he wanted to save was found near a window in one of the upper floors. Newspapers said no family came to claim his remains.